Here we go! Did you know? One of Shigeru Miyamoto's earliest influences for Super Mario 64 came from watching his pet hamster wander around his room. This experience likely influenced not only the size of Mario 64's stages, but its free-roaming camera as well. He was also inspired by miniature train sets and dioramas, but Miyamoto's first thoughts about a 3D Mario came years earlier while working on the original Star Fox. His team experimented with a prototype based on the SNES Super FX chip, but the technology technology just wasn't there yet. It ended up taking five more years for Miyamoto's vision to become a reality. Mario 64 was the first Nintendo 64 game to enter development. In fact, work began long before the N64 actually existed. So the developers started by making prototypes on a computer and keyboard. They didn't have a proper controller for the next six months, so they modified some Sega controllers for testing. These controllers were likely XE1 AP Sega Genesis controllers, which had an analog stick years years before the N64, PlayStation or Sega Saturn were even conceived. About 100 different N64 controllers were developed by Nintendo R&D 3, and each controller was tested with Mario 64 to see if it was up to scratch. According to R&D 3's manager, Genyo Takeda, they became more ambitious with each new controller, even prototyping a motion sensor wristwatch. The watch worked so well that they actually filed for a patent. However, when the wristwatch was playtested by a focus group full of kids, they were confused by how it worked. In the end, R&D3 had to abandon the idea. Did you know gaming asked Mario 64 programmer Giles Goddard about the prototype controllers and if there was anything memorable from Nintendo's tests. Goddard said, There was one prototype joystick I worked on that stood out. It was made by a UK company, I think, and it had the ability to programmatically constrict movement in two axes. I thought we could use it to give force feedback or to give texture to certain movements, but when I made some test demos with it, it felt more like it was stuck on something instead. Still, it was way ahead of its time as there was no such thing as haptics back then. Ultimately, they settled on the N64 controller we know today, even though Miyamoto was still dissatisfied with it, and actually wanted a second D-pad instead of the C buttons. The game started out as just Mario running around an empty grid, with the next character added being Mips the Rabbit. From there, the team spent months just perfecting Mario's movements and the game's camera, ironing out these fundamentals before they built even a single stage. Assistant director Yoshiaki Koizumi made nearly 250 different Mario animations, about 50 of which got cut, including a somersault that probably broke Mario's fall after a long drop. A few animations didn't get cut, but ended up virtually useless, like the crouching trip kick, which Koizumi says he made for beating specific enemies that never got programmed into the game. To test out different camera systems, developers ran experiments like creating a mountain and having Mario and Mips race to the summit, then switching the camera and going again. They tested out thousands of different camera systems, having it locked, having it move, having it so the player could controlled it entirely, and so on. There was one programmer whose whole job was just working on the camera system, and one day he finally came up with a camera Miyamoto was happy with. But it wasn't long before a Nintendo lawyer ran upstairs and told them Sega had a patent for switching cameras, which sent shockwaves through the entire office. They investigated what sort of legal consequences they might face by using Sega's patent, but ultimately decided to throw caution to the wind and use it anyway, praying they wouldn't get sued. And they never did. Mario's face on the game's title screen was originally made for a prototype of Mario Paint 3D, which ultimately released as Mario Artist Paint Studio on the 64DD. The game's main menu has an interesting origin as well. It's directly based on an SGI graphics demo called Buttonfly. SGI machines were used to make N64 games, and the machine's tools clearly had an influence on how Mario 64 was made. Another influence for Mario 64 was licensed asset packs. Nintendo used sound libraries from the company Sound Ideas, which can be heard prominently in early versions of the game. Some early clips used samples of Looney Tunes actor Mel Blanc for Mario's voice. The game's art director was also influenced by these asset packs. Several researchers have combed countless archives and asset packs to find Mario 64's original textures. Many of Mario 64's textures come from the Japanese Material Dictionary Datacraft series, which have hundreds of photos of natural and man-made objects. This use of stock imagery might also be why the background of the shifting sand land features the Great Pyramids of Giza, and why the wet-dry world uses a photo of Casares, Spain. 
Many textures also come from SGI workstations the game was developed on, such as the texture for Metal Mario. When it came time to build a Mushroom Kingdom, stages were designed on a fixed path with a flagpole at the end, just like classic 2D Mario stages. But the team decided it'd be more fun if players could wander around freely, like Miyamoto's hamster exploring his room, so they replaced the flagpoles with a series of stars. This also freed up cartridge space and reduced the level design workload. The designers didn't use blueprints when making levels, instead adding and subtracting from levels until they felt right. The first stage made was Babomb Battlefield, which originally had a river running through it. But when the team playtested it, they realized that the river's current was too strong and could be frustrating, so they drained all the water and left a dry valley in its place. Programmer Hajime Yajima wanted stages to have destructible terrain, which the game would remember. One example he gave was the player destroying a block, and the game remembering the block was gone for the entire playthrough. According to programmer Giles Goddard, half the team was focused on developing, while the other half just focused on playtesting. They even brought in some children, including Miyamoto's own son, to playtest Bobomb Battlefield and see what they thought. As a director, Miyamoto was happy to see the kids were all having fun, but as a parent, he was concerned to see his son trying to run up an unclimbable hill over and over again. After a few dozen attempts, Miyamoto started to wonder about his son's intelligence. A couple months later, co-director Takashi Tezuka told Nintendo Power they'd already made 32 stages and the final game might even have 40, plus bonus areas like the princess's secret slide. However, the stage count ended up being scaled back, and the final game only had 15 stages. The overall difficulty was dialed back too. According to Miyamoto, there was a change late in development which made gaps easier to jump than in 2D Mario's, as the team worried players might have a hard time judging distances in 3D. This a lot of booing from the staff, who felt strongly that the game's difficulty should remain intact. A large portion of Mario 64's development overlapped with the production of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, resulting in lots of ideas originally meant for one game getting switched to the other. Mario 64 had more puzzles than any previous game in the series, with areas like Shifting Sandlands Pyramid feeling more like a Zelda dungeon than the Mushroom Kingdom. That's because many puzzles were actually made for Ocarina of Time, but were moved over to Mario Mario due to its development being behind schedule. Taking assets from Zelda and putting them in Mario 64 was an easy way to speed up development. Even the castle system itself was initially meant for Zelda, but got repurposed for Peach's castle. The Nintendo 64 and its three launch titles were originally scheduled to release at Christmas 1995, but the launch date was delayed twice, so Miyamoto had more time to flesh out Mario 64. When the game finally launched in June 1996, critics praised it for setting a new standard in gaming. It eventually sold 12 million copies, making it the best-selling N64 game ever and spawned a whole generation of copycats. A long-running trend Miyamoto chalked up to Nintendo's culture. He said, I believe we are not making Japanese games, but are making Kyoto games. The taste of a Kyoto game is different from that of a Tokyo game. We Kyotoites hate to follow the fashion, but rather love to set the fashion. We really did want to change the culture of gaming, and it was in that spirit that we made Mario 64. In Miyamoto's view, this explains Nintendo's devotion to innovation and forging their own path, while Sega and Sony's Tokyo-based competition always left them following the trends. Despite all the delays, Mario 64 actually had the quickest development cycle of any game in the series, and the stress took a heavy toll on Nintendo's staff. The entire game was made by just 15 people, and afterwards two of them were so burnt out they quit programming and never worked on another video game ever again. It was the end of an era for Miyamoto as well. Mario 64 was the last time he sat in the director's chair. In the 25 years since, he's only worked as a producer, supervising the work of directors and their teams. When Mario 64 first launched in Japan, it cost 9,800 yen, roughly 100 US dollars. Miyamoto winced at the price tag and went on record saying Mario 64 should have been closer to $60, which ultimately became the price when it launched in America three months later. The American version fixed some bugs and had other small updates, like Mario saying hello on the start screen and rambling in his sleep about spaghetti and ravioli. In the original Japanese version, the princess didn't talk at all. For the American update, they added the voice of Leslie Swan, the senior editor of Nintendo 
Nintendo Power magazine and also had her localize the game's text. Ten months later, Japan got their own update of Mario 64, the Rumble Pack compatible version, Shindo Paku Tayo. As the name implies, the biggest update was a new Rumble feature, which stayed exclusive to Japan. The updates from the US version were brought over as well, with more bug fixes. The developers also let players summon 40 copies of Mario's face on the game's title screen, but even after all the updates and extra development months, Miyamoto still wished he had more time. Mario was the first game developed for the N64, so the team hadn't figured out how to take full advantage of the technology. Ultimately, lots of content was cut, including three separate modes incorporating Luigi. One was a split-screen mode where Mario and Luigi started on opposite ends of the castle and ended up meeting in the middle. Another mode was more like a traditional co-op, with the camera pulling back to fit both players on one screen. Earlier versions of the game were even called Ultra 64 Mario Brothers, referencing Luigi's inclusion and the N64's original name, the Ultra 64. Due to programming difficulties, Luigi got cut just months before Mario 64 hit store shelves. The team tried to make up for it by adding a Mario Bros style minigame with Luigi, but this was cut as the N64 was only bundled with one controller, making multiplayer a rarity for most players at launch. Immediately after wrapping up Mario 64, Miyamoto started talking about a sequel. In May 1996, he told reporters, I couldn't put everything into Super Mario 64 that I really wanted, so we've decided to continue working toward a sequel which will take about a year and a half at least. For Super Mario 64, I believe we have utilized only 60% of the whole capacity of the N64 technology. He later dubbed the sequel Mario 128 and told fans a prototype was sitting on his desk that had Luigi as a playable character, but he wasn't satisfied just bringing back cut content from Mario 64 and was exploring four players split screen like in Mario Kart 64. The sequel would change the gameplay, add more enemies and retool the presentation. Miyamoto wanted to shake off Mario's just for kids image by ditching his then iconic peace sign and having him stop smiling and laughing so much for no good reason. He even did an interview in Japanese Playboy Weekly to hype it up, telling Playboy that Mario 128 would offer a fresh new experience. But in the end, the sequel was never finished and footage of it was never made public. All the cut content from Mario 64, along with all Miyamoto's brand new ideas, were either recycled into other games or left on the chopping block. Did you also know Diddy Kong is actually in Mario Kart 64? Or that Wario was German in Mario Kart 64? For more facts, click the video on screen. I'm Seth Everman.